Welcome to one and all to this, our first online event for Friends of Sinn Féin USA. Can I firstly say that I hope you are all safe and well. The COVID-19 pandemic has demonstrated that we truly live in a global village. Families and communities across Ireland, across the United States, across the world have been affected by this virus and we stand together in solidarity at this time. We also send our solidarity and best wishes to the United States as we watch the, the deaths, the protests and the unrests on the streets of many of your cities in recent times. Now is the time for us to do the right thing, to treat each other with equality and respect and to dig deep into those shared values of unity and inclusion. You join our conversation at a time of history making for our nation. Our colleague Michelle O'Neill, Las Uchtaron Sinn Féin, jointly leads government in the north of Ireland, while in the south Sinn Féin has become the largest political party following last February's election. The opportunities that present before us are immense. But to get to Irish unity, we have to talk, we have to plan ahead. And I'm very glad that this evening we have a woman of the calibre of Professor Christine Keneally from Quinnipiac at University to moderate our discussion. Christine is a fellow graduate of Trinity College Dublin. She is an author, she is a historian, and she is a woman well capable of keeping good order with the two unmanageable revolutionaries who will participate in our discussion this evening. Christine? Thank you, Mary Lou, for those inspirational words. Good evening and welcome to this discussion on Irish unity. I am Christine Keneally, the Director of Ireland's Great Hunger Institute at Quinnipiac University, and I will be moderating this discussion. I am joined by two very distinguished guests to lead it, helped, of course, by your questions. I would like to start with brief bios of my guests. Firstly, Gerry Adams. Gerry Adams is the former president of Sinn Féin. He was MP for West Belfast between 1983 and 2010, and a TD for Louth East Meath between 2011 and 2020. Gerry grew up in the Ballymurphy district of West Belfast. He joined Sinn Féin when it was still a banned organisation in the mid-1960s, and along with other Republican activists, became involved in campaigns demanding equal rights for the minority Catholic population. He attended the first meeting of the civil rights movement in 1967. In 1972, Jerry was interned without trial. In June of that year, he was released to participate in secret talks in London between Irish Republicans and the British government. The British Supreme Court recently quashed Jerry's two convictions for attempting to escape from internment at a time when he was unlawfully imprisoned. This is a historic ruling. Jerry is widely credited as one of the main architects of the Irish peace process and of the Good Friday Agreement. Since then, he has played a key role in creating the conditions for peace elsewhere, most notably in the Basque country. In 2018, Jerry stepped down as leader of Sinn Féin and he did not stand for re-election to the Dáil in the February general election. Jerry has worked with successive US administrations and political leaders to promote the cause of Irish unity, peace and independence. Welcome, Jerry. Thank you, Christine. And our second distinguished guest is Congressman Joseph Crowley, Joe. Joe Crowley represented the people of New York's 14th Congressional District, including his hometown of Woodside, Queens, in the US Congress for nearly 20 years. He served in the House Democratic leadership for six years, first as vice chair and then as chairman of the caucus. Joe is the son of an Irish American father, Joseph F. Crowley Sr., and an immigrant mother, Eileen Crowley, from County Armagh. During his time in office, Joe was a member of the prestigious House Committee on Ways and Means, where he worked to protect Social Security and Medicare. Joe was on the front line of efforts to pass the Affordable Care Act, enact marriage equality in New York State, and protect women's rights and human rights. 
He was also a three-time co-chair of the Congressional Caucus on India and Indian Americans. He was chair of the New Democratic Coalition and co-founder of both the Bangladesh Caucus and Rare Diseases Caucus. Joe has been a champion for Irish causes throughout his career, which began in the New York State Assembly, where he sponsored and led the charge to pass the 1996 bill that requires New York State schools to include the great Irish hunger in the curriculum. Joe is a co-chair of the Ad Hoc Committee on Irish Affairs and an active member of the Friends of Ireland Caucus throughout his congressional career. He also worked on resolving the conflict in the north of Ireland. Joe's spouse Casey is a registered nurse and they have three children, Cullen 20, Kenzie 19 and Liam 14. They're also rearing a one-year-old chocolate lab, Bruce Springsteen Crowley. Joe, you are very welcome to this program. Thank you, Chrissy. Good to see you again. Good to see you. So perhaps we could start off with the current situation. These last three months have been very strange throughout the world and the last 10 days have been particularly painful within the United States. Could you both address the situation of COVID-19 and the recent riots in the United States? And could I start with Joe, please? Well, Christine, um, these certainly have been incredibly challenging times for the world, uh, first dealing with COVID-19, uh, the e economic uh, fallout impact of the uh, virus itself, and I think the human condition, people being locked away, uh, isolated um, uh, within their homes, not being able to go to work if they could work and having to work from home. And then here in the States, uh, to add that, I think that frustration that has been building up um, and the concern and, and I think uh, the despair that some people have. Um, and then to be met um, with the horrific murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis, uh, at the hands of four uh, police officers, individuals who were charged to protect um, human life and, and, and a property. Um, clearly by the video, um, uh, uh, you know, George Floyd was alive uh, um, and moments later was dead, uh, apparently trying to maybe pass off a $20 bill in terms of counterfeit. We don't really know if that actually was the case. Um, he never got his day in court. It was uh, summarily executed uh, right there in the streets of Minneapolis. And I think a very dark day for our country. But again, or I shouldn't say again, I just reiterate for myself, not necessarily new, either the perceived or the real violence uh, against um, minority populations, particularly the African-American population, uh, has, has been something that has been happening in, in our country um, really since the inception of it and the fallout from slavery. Um, and uh, our country has never gotten fully behind, beyond that yet. We have a will, uh, but we need to make more efforts uh, to, to change. And I, I, I look forward to hearing Jerry's response to this as well, because I can tell you that uh, in watching the, the, the protests, the peaceful protests uh, being met by rubber bullets, really hearkened me back as a young man to uh, Ireland, uh, the north of Ireland, uh, during the civil rights movement and to see innocent people being uh, attacked by, again, their own police force, supposedly there to protect their lives and their property, uh, but uh, we're actually uh, taking away their civil right to protest. Uh, we see that in the streets of, the, of, of New York, Minneapolis, of every major city in our country today. And it's um, it's been moving at the same time it's been harrowing. Okay. Jerry, would you like to comment and then perhaps we'll come back to COVID? Yeah, well, I mean, just watching what's happening in the States and, you know, I travel there a lot uh, before the pandemic anyway, and it's a great country and I've met many great people and very good leaders uh, there. But it's long been my position that the issue of race is one of the unresolved issues in Irish, or sorry, in uh, U.S. society. It's not unique to America. I mean, we, we, we have issues of racism here in Ireland, the treatment of the traveler community and other uh, small ethnic groups. But what always struck me in, in, in the States and strikes me about racism, you know, it has to be taught. And it's, it's, it's artificial. That there can be no such thing as somebody being superior to somebody else on the basis of their 
skin color or some other you know, superficial uh, characteristic. It's, it's, it's ridiculous, it's obscene, it's totally and absolutely wrong. And where it really is dangerous is when it affects and infects the agencies or the institutions of the state. So it needs tackled. Uh, the way to tackle racism is to do it in, in your own place. So we have to do it here, but people in the States have to do it there. And I uh, wish, wish everyone well. Uh, everybody deserves to be treated equally. You know, racism, some people through ignorance, stupidity. But it really is an artificial means of dividing people and okay. controlling people. And okay. that that needs tackled. And the example has to be set by leaders. And I'm very taken by, I'm just going to read this if I may, by a little quote from John Lewis, Representative John Lewis, one of my heroes and as someone who was active in the civil rights movement here. I mean, I know plastic bullets and rubber bullets don't work. You know, I know gas doesn't work. But what, what John said, and he was through all of that, was organize, demonstrate, stand up, be constructive. That's the way forward. And I echo that. And I wish people there well. And I, I also just on, on, on the pandemic, I, I hope all my friends are, are, are doing well. You know, it is, as you said, Christine, it is a strange time. And, you know, on, on this little island of Ireland, 2,194 people have died through this pandemic. And some of them uh, in congregated settings like nursing homes, where it's, I think, been a very lonely and, uh, you know, awful death. Uh, the health workers, the frontline workers, all of those people who are normally not that well paid uh, are, are the great heroes. I applaud them all. I'm sure the same, your your wife, Joe All, they're just absolutely out, outstanding. Now, we, we, we have a number of difficulties here. First of all, with two, with two parliaments on the island of Ireland. And we also have Britain retaining a lot of powers. And the, the, the position that uh, Johnson, the British Prime Minister, took was stupid, absolutely shambolic, and totally farcical if it wasn't so uh, serious. So it, it took a while for the executive here in the North to become a wee bit more, more cohesive and not to follow blindly the British uh, lead. But thankfully that has happened under the leadership of Arlene Foster and Michelle O'Neill. There's now a much more cohesive approach. And across the island, they're now into a phased uh, withdrawal from the lockdown. OK, thank you, Jerry. Joe, we wish your wife and all health workers safe, safety. Uh, would you like to comment on COVID? Because New York has been so badly hit. Well, New York has been, in many respects, the epicenter of the virus here in New York. Um, we're uh, we're coming down in terms of, of of number of cases as well as deaths, uh, and uh, we 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 wait earnestly for the day there there are no more deaths. Uh, we're also concerned, though, about a resurgence of the virus this fall, and and there's been some concern because of the protests uh, that that could actually uptick in a couple of weeks. So we. We, 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 we hope that's not the case and that um, we're past the worst of it. Um, but uh, we, we no, really judging from history, the, um, the Spanish flu uh, and its recurrence that happened back in the early part of the last century, uh, that history can, can teach us something that it's, it's in all likelihood possible, more than possible, that it can come back. And I would say that um, uh, I think we were, we, we, as, as caught off guard as we were, it seems it seems though we were more resilient than we gave ourselves credit for as well. Uh, and so I do want to applaud all the first responders, uh, nurses, doctors, police and fire who respond to this. You know, you know as this is going on uh, the, in terms of the unrest here, it's also important to note the police officers themselves that uh, uh, as peace officers were exposed uh, at a higher rate than the average uh, population as were firefighters. So. Uh, as we go through this, I, one other note, my, my father was a New York City police officer, as was my grandfather before him. Uh, and I know that overwhelmingly um, the men and women who serve as police officers today are good, honorable and decent people. And it's always those few that would really, I think, um, demonstrate uh, 
um, you know, the, the callousness that a, a few can really paint a broad brush with everyone. Um, but there is systemic racism in our society in, in the United States. And it also is, exists to a degree within the police and first responders as well, as well as our military. And I think it's important for us as a country in order to heal, to address those issues uh, as we are addressing the issue of COVID-19. It's not going to happen overnight, uh, but we have to be steadily working towards that. Okay, thank you. So, Joe, you mentioned history a few times, and historically the role of Irish America has been very important in supporting Irish independence. Would you like to mention in what ways you think it's been important? Well, I think really uh, since the inception of our country, going back uh, uh, prior to the Civil War, the uh, the, the cause uh, of the great migration from the uh, uh, from the island of Ireland that you and I worked on an issue, I won't say, Christine, I dare to say 20, over 20, almost uh, a quarter century ago, in, in terms of, you mentioned earlier, the, the, the curriculum in New York State, the great hunger. Uh, and what drove those people was the subjugation um, of Ireland by the, the British government in those days that um, caused the, the deaths of millions and uh, the, the migration and immigration to the United States uh, and around the world, but uh, uh, particularly the United States, of millions of Irish men and women uh, who never lost the cause uh, towards uh, and the pining for their own country to be free. Um, uh, uh, the history of America is replete of attempts by the Irish in America to influence its government, uh, to, bre to bear on the British government. Uh, we see that uh, around World War I again, uh, then with the 1916 uprising. Um, and uh, uh, again, um, uh, really, I think the watershed moments took place in 1990 and in the 1990s. I think Jerry would speak to as well. Uh, but uh, as particularly from my own vantage point, 1992, um, uh, during the presidential election of Bill Clinton, um, when he made commitments in New York when he was campaigning for the Democratic nomination to issue a, a, a visa to then Jerry Adams, um, and as well uh, to send a special envoy uh, to the North of Ireland to help. Uh, promoted peace process, and which eventually led to the appointment of George Mitchell, and uh, you know, one of the, uh, again one of the authors of the uh, driving authors of the Good Friday Agreement, uh, which led to ultimately to that agreement uh, uh, being enacted and voted on uh, uh, nationwide, uh, both north and south in Ireland, uh, was really monumental. And again, I, I would not say that it was Irish America that made that happen, but we played a critical role, I think, in terms of keeping that pressure on and being that broker. Uh, that was needed uh, for both Britain and for Ireland as well. Okay, thank you, Joe. Jerry, could you maybe just say two or three sentences about the role of Irish? I, I, I agree with uh, with what Joe has said, and a very eloquent testimony to the role of Irish America is in our proclamation of the Republic in 1916, where they refer to the leaders refer to our uh, gallant children in America, and. You have chronicled, and I applaud the work you've done on multiple publications, Christine, the story of the Great Hunger and, and Gorta Moore. And there is a line from, from that day, and before that, going right back to 1790s, when uh, men and women in Ireland and the United Irish societies followed the example of the American revolutionaries and the French revolutionaries. So we have long connections. But here's, here's the thing. Now is the time for Irish America again. This is Irish America's time. There would not be a peace process when there was a peace process. There would not be a Good Friday Agreement without Irish America. That is absolutely clear. If Bill Clinton had not been persuaded to intervene to overturn what was decades of U.S. foreign policy of accepting the British position, then God knows where we would all be this day. So Irish America played and has played a key role in all the big moments in the history of this small island of Ireland. And now it's your day, because we have for the first time ever, the, 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 the United Irish Society didn't have it, the, the Republicans of 1916 didn't have it, Bobby Sands didn't have it. We now have, thanks to the Good Friday Agreement, a peaceful way to end the union with Britain. And what I would like to do is to say to people in Irish America, Come forward, lobby, be active, campaign, help the friends of Sinn Féin, try and get and help us to get 
that referendum so that we can decide our own future. We, our future should not be decided for us by anyone else other than the people who live on the island of Ireland. Whatever their views, whatever their position, it's up to us to decide our future. And now we have the means and the opportunity. It's now a doable project, folks. We can now do it. Okay, so Jerry, you've talked about the Good Friday Agreement. It's now 22 years old. So what main changes has it brought to Ireland? Well, I suppose the most visible change is that it marked an end to conflict. And if you go back to the period that Joe chronicled, uh, the big breakthrough there was John Hume and myself agreeing on Hume Adams, and that led to other de developments. And what I was arguing, and you know, I just mentioned this because it's important, Father Alex Reed and Father Des Wilson and I, both deceased, played critical roles. And what, what I was putting it to them was, we need an alternative. So the Good Friday Agreement became the alternative to uh, conflict, and it, it, it uh, out, outlines a whole uh, array of rights and entitlements, many of which have not yet been won. This is an ongoing process of, of change. So it, it isn't you know, a static, a peace process by its very name, a process of change by its very name is a continuum. It's a movement towards rights, towards everything else that we deserve as human beings. But critically, in this issue of the future of the island of Ireland, it does provide that means to end partition, if that's what we want, and to end the union uh, with Britain, if that's what we want. And, you know, I'm, I'm an Irish Republican. I'm a United Irelander. I don't see any reason, you know, the English are very welcome here as tourists. They're decent people of their own <laughs> worries and their own concerns. Uh, but no English government has any right to be interfering in the affairs of the people of the end of Ireland. Okay, thank you, Jerry. So can I ask Joe, Joe, do you think Irish Americans have an appreciation that this is a process, that it isn't done and dusted, and that more needs to be done? It's a great question, Christine. I think um, there hasn't been as much introspect that I would, uh, I would appreciate, I think, here in the States. Um, I think that uh, in many respects, um, uh, you, you know, you, Irish in America and those who take an active part and care about this issue, uh, as I do, I think uh, in some respects that uh, the battle is won, that we had the Good Friday Agreement, that there's peace uh, on the island of Ireland. Uh, and because prior to the Brexit issue, there was no border to speak of between uh, uh, what is now Northern Ireland and uh, the Republic. Um, uh, that has changed a bit now, potentially with Brexit. We don't know where this will all end in the end. There's been uh, some suggestion that that border will be in the Irish Sea, um, but uh, I'll believe it when I see it, as we say. Um, and that uh, I do, th I agree with Jerry that it is important for Irish America to not only stay engaged, really re-engage in terms of its commitment towards a united Ireland. Um, that uh, even amongst our elected officials, for instance, many of whom, you know, uh, had, uh, I think, traditionally been Democrats, uh, not American Republicans, but Democrats here in, in the States, um, we see more and more Republicans. And I, and I, I think it needs to be bipartisan in terms of the support. Uh, you know, Peter King and I, uh, we disagreed on many domestic issues and may, maybe a lot of issues but we both saw eye to eye on the issue of Ireland itself and the need to bring transformative change uh, to the island uh, to unite the country. Um, but we see other people like myself. I'm, I was uh, uh, <laughs> ceremoniously unelected two years ago, um, and I was a very active member of the Friends of, uh, of Ireland as well as a co-chair of the Adhoc Committee on Irish Affairs. Elliot Engel, uh, who is one of the co-chairs of the uh, Ad Hoc Committee on Irish Affairs is actually in, in the primary of his life on June 23rd. Uh, and so uh, there's another potential uh, sting there. So he, more on the Mario Biaggi, uh, uh, those of us who remember Mario Biaggi, the Italian-American from the Bronx who really led the charge when others were silenced, uh, others were silenced, in, including Irish-Americans who wouldn't speak the words that Mario Biaggi did. Elliot Engel has also been on the forefront there. So I see a withering away to some degree uh, Mike Capuano from Boston losing his primary. Uh, Mike uh, was very strongly involved. He's half Irish and uh, attended many of the meetings that Jerry and others 
uh, 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 put together uh, on Capitol Hill. So I have that concern. I think, as Jerry said, it's important for people to reach out to the representatives, to the senators, and local government as well, uh, to remind them that this is not done, uh, that it's far from done, and that the Good Friday Agreement has yet to be fulfilled. Okay, thank you both. Uh, we have a lot of questions coming in, and inevitably many of them are concerning Brexit, which Joe has just mentioned. One listener points out that the European Union has promised that a united Ireland would have automatic membership. Do you think this has had an impact on the unity debate, Jerry? Yes, it definitely has, Christine. Uh, first of all, Brexit is a disaster, and I don't have any objections people in Britain to say that they want to leave the European Union. That's that's a matter for them. But Ireland didn't come into any of the considerations of the three prime ministers who were responsible for this. David Cameron, Theresa May, to be crowned by Boris Johnson. Ireland didn't factor in it at all at all. And what they've produced is a very disunited kingdom with, with Scotland and Wales taking different positions uh, from 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 London, and of course, famously, the people of the North voted to remain within the European Union, and that also has been ignored, not just by London, but also by the Democratic Unionist Party. So people don't like being ignored. When when people vote for something in a referendum, and then it's just set to one side, they don't like that. Now, I'm not saying they're turning into United Irelanders overnight. Those who may have had a pro-union position. But they certainly are looking at, at the reality that if we crash out of the European Union and, you know, Britain has left, there's a transitional period until the end of the year uh, and the EU and others, including Sinn Féin, want to see the transition period extended. But Boris Johnson is refusing so far to uh, do that. So we're, we're in very, very perilous straits. The, the Irish Protocol uh, it did help, but even it is in, in, in doubt. And, and Brexit drives a, a, a coach and horses through the Good Friday Agreement. And, and, and again, you see the power of Irish America, the Speaker, uh, Nancy Pelosi, uh, Rich, Richie Neal, uh, others, both speaking and warning uh, London that the USA would not for a second countenance any interference or erosion of the Good Friday Agreement. And then they came to Ireland and they repeated that in Dublin, they repeated it up on the border and they repeated it in London as as well. And just just one last we were just to you know to hark back for a second to the ongoing uh, pandemic. You know, I, I said we have two parliaments here in this uh, island, but the pandemic doesn't recognize the border. So, yeah. so there's an all island approach needed, and just just at the weekend, our president Michael D. Higgins said we can't afford not to have an all Ireland approach. We can't afford not to have an all island approach. So similarly with uh, Brexit, we need to have uh, an all Ireland, all island uh, approach, and to put up and to be very, very, very certain of acting in Irish national interest, the 32 counties of Ireland. That's what the Irish government has to do. The Tories won't do it. The unionists will be caught, the leadership caught up in their own position. So we have to do this for ourselves. Okay, thank you, Jerry. Joe, would you like to add anything on Brexit? I, I think uh, Jerry really covered it very well, especially in terms of the role of the United States. Uh, Great Britain uh, wants to uh, reestablish or reconnect its trade with the EU, but more importantly, I think they want to reconnect their trade agreement with the United States, a new bilateral trade agreement. Uh, that uh, agreement would have to go through the Ways and Means Committee, which is chaired by Richie Neal. Uh, and uh, Richie has been the stalwart uh, when it comes to the issue of I Irish unification of the island of Ireland. And I think, as, as Jerry also pointed out, are the strong words of Speaker Nancy Pelosi. In order to get any trade agreement through, it would have to come through the House of Representatives and have the support of the majority, which is controlled by the Democratic Caucus, that um, uh, it's going to be important uh, for uh, the British to understand that no trade agreement will happen if, we, if our country does not believe that the Good Friday Agreement 
is uh, being materialized. And uh, I want to I want to employ Tom Swazi, uh, a, a newer member of the House of Representatives as well, who has led the charge in terms of a resolution on the floor stating just that, as well as mentioning once again Elliot Engel, who is the chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee in the House of Representatives. So in many respects, we are poised and positioned in the House and the Senate, uh, and we mean, need to maintain that and to reinvigorate and revitalize that support. But I have to say, uh, Nancy Pelosi has been outstanding in terms of her leadership on this issue and her willingness to speak not only here in America, not only in uh, Ireland, but in Great Britain itself, in London itself, those very same words. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you to all the listeners who are sending in questions. One question that is coming up frequently and something that seems to perplex some people in America is they know there were elections recently in the Republic. They know Sinn Féin had a historic victory. They don't quite understand what's going on. And some listeners have framed it in the question, why is there such a reluctance by the two traditionally major parties in the Republic to engage with Irish republicanism. Jerry, could you answer that, please? Well, Mary Lou MacDonald, our party president, put it very, very well. She said it's all about Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael holding on to power. And that's essentially what it is. There are the two main parties who have dominated politics in the southern state since partition. You know, when partition was part of the counter-revolution, there were two conservative states established on the island of Ireland at that time. Uh, time and any attempt to develop an egalitarian uh, affair, uh, a vision based on decency and equality has always been thwarted. And, and we had a wonderful breakthrough led by Mary Lou in the last uh, election here. And these two parties are now uh, colluding, despite both saying they would not go into power together. They're now colluding to do just that, and they're about the business of trying to form uh, a government. And the big thing out of the election, and we got this in the doorsteps, was change. It, it wasn't our slogan. It was our slogan two or three years ago, time for change. But when we were going around the doors this time, that's what people were saying to us. It's time for change. These two big parties are not parties for change. The homelessness crisis, the crisis in health service, the refusal, they downright refuse to support that part of the Good Friday Agreement, which sets out the means by which you can have a referendum in Irish unity. So they're not about change, they're about the status quo and holding on to power. Okay, thank you. So, Joe, would you like to add anything to what Jerry has said about the need for change and what Irish America can do in that sense? I think I might leave the Irish politics to the people of Ireland to determine, I would hope and pray, uh, that all parties within Ireland would recognize the advantages of a united Ireland uh, and move towards that. They don't have to agree on all the issues or even how to get there, per se, but they all have the goal of getting there. Um, and I think that American politics, as I mentioned earlier, can play a role. I think having American elected officials speak about the need for a united Ireland, that's important. Uh, and to, to, re to restate that over and over again uh, at every opportunity. Okay. I think, Christine, many, many times in the last 30 years or so, Irish America has been ahead of the Dublin politicians. There are numerous examples. I mean, the Birmingham Six, uh, the Irish government of the day actively campaigned against uh, justice for those uh, who were imprisoned unjustly and campaigned against the McBride principles and so on. So, uh, so Irish America, as Joe has said, if, if Irish America can, can raise these issues, then Dublin has to listen. Okay, thank you both. So now maybe let's move across to London because a number of listeners have asked about the role of Britain. Jim Gallagher, Liam O'Dunn and others have asked, can Britain be trusted to hold a referendum on the border despite it being part of the Good Friday Agreement? Will Britain change the goalposts? Jerry? Well, I don't think uh, Britain, and by Britain I mean the British ruling class, I don't mean the people of Britain can be trusted in anything at all uh, that's got to do with uh, Ireland. Look, it's, for me, it's so simple. Uh, I was born into a state which didn't want me. I was one of hundreds of thousands of people caught 
in that historical cul-de-sac. Now we have, not least because of the help of our friends and the USA, we have made many, many, many changes in that process. But it isn't that long ago when the Brits said to everybody, butt out, none of your business. This is an internal matter for the government of the United Kingdom. And it was only when we got outside that frame and then the international community, and it started off with the USA, and we, and we very consciously worked with our friends, people who had been involved in Norad in the past and Clan the Gale and others that Joe has described who were always stalwarts, Mario Biagi and others who throughout the decades kept base. But then the rest of the international community came into it also in terms of you know, Canadians and people from the Nordic countries, South Africa and, and others. So there is a responsibility in terms of the global uh, community out there to support processes like the one in Ireland and to keep the British government. The Good Friday Agreement is an international agreement. It's an agreement between two governments voted on by the people of the island of Ireland and lodged and guaranteed, by the way. Bill, Bill Clinton made it very clear that he was coming in as a guarantor on behalf of the USA for the Good, Good Friday Agreement. So how, how we keep the British ruling class honest is to not let them have their own way. And international best practice in relation to Ireland, which means that the people of this island have freedom, that that's our entitlement, that's our right, and I, I believe it's our duty to bring that about with, with all speed. Okay, thank you, Jerry. So Joe, are you and Irish America ready to keep the British government honest yet again? Well, I think uh, hearkening back to a very well-known uh, a political figure in American history, someone of the other persuasion, the Republican, Ronald Reagan, when dealing with Russia, said, trust but verify. I think here there has to be a lot more verification than even even trust. Uh, I, I do think that the British people uh, want to see this movement uh, move, move on. They want to move on, I believe, wholeheartedly, the majority. It's really the government itself, uh, and it's about power. Um, and I think that, that those are the things that have always sy systemically been in the way. Uh, but I do think, like we see, we've seen change in the United States, and we're seeing the disruption because of some of that as well. There's been tremendous change in Ireland, um, economically, socially. The upheaval and the change in the Republic of Ireland has been remarkable, at least from the perspective of America. Uh, and so we're not even dealing with the same Republic of Ireland that we were in the 1990s or 1980s, 70s, 60s, or certainly beyond before that. And that has had an impact, I think, in terms of how we're, how Ireland is interpreted in in in, in Britain. Uh, but certainly throughout the whole Brexit issue, uh, the Good Friday Agreement has been brought up again and again by the Irish government, to their credit, to America. Uh, but the EU as well have have been faithful to that agreement, and I think that is very critical and important. As Jerry mentioned, it is an international agreement. Okay. Thank you both. So we have another question, this time from our good friend Niall O'Dowd of the Irish Voice and Irish Central. Niall asks, how do you instill a sense of urgency into Irish America on the unity issue, similar to the all-out focus on the peace process in the 1990s? Jerry, would you like to answer that first? Well, greetings uh, to Neil and Debbie and Alana. Uh, well, first, first of all, to say and to credit Neil has been one of the, the main thinkers in the USA that brought together uh, the, the catalyst, the beginning of that process of bringing the uh, Irish Americans for uh, a new agenda together and lobbying President Clinton and so on and so forth. Uh, one of my last conversations with a, a good friend since deceased, Bill Flynn, another leader at that time, and it was in New York, and he said, would it be great to get back the spirit and the atmosphere that we had in the build-up to the peace process? Now, I, I don't think it's possible to get it the way we had it, because that was big, that was huge, that was seismic. But I do think it is possible to reinvigorate, that's the term that Joe used, to reinvigorate it, Irish America. And, and how we do that is to consider what I said previously, this is now the issue of Irish unity is a doable project. It can be done. 
British rule in Ireland has been reduced to a referendum in which the people will decide the future. So what what thinking, what you know, good-hearted Irish American or indeed people from any other background wouldn't like to play a role in bringing that about. Mary Lou Macdonald, our leader, has said she wants to see a referendum in five years' time. And the reason why she gave that lead-in time was so that we can have the debate, so that we can persuade people, so that we can work out, not, not like Brexit, working it out afterwards, but work out beforehand. So there's one way of a thousand and reinvigorating Irish America for everybody listening to this broadcast and for everyone who they talk to, to say to them, you know, we can end the British connection. We can end the union. We can end the partition of Ireland peacefully and democratically. If we get our government, our Congress members, our local politicians, our women's group, our trade union movement, wherever we're active in our community, get them come in behind this rightful part of the Good Friday Agreement and make it a reality. Okay, thank you. Joe, would you like to add to that? I would, Christina. I, I think it's important to note that be, behind the movement towards the peace process in the North of Ireland was a, an, an overwhelming desire by Irish in America to see unification of the entire island of Ireland. That was never diminished. That was never lost. It may not have been referred to as often because of their primacy of ending violence. Um, but uh, but the commitment towards that has always been there and always will be there. But I think, Christine, it's, it's critically important for Irish America, again, to shift a little bit, just slightly, and talk more often about Irish unity and Irish unification uh, of the island of Ireland and really impose upon elected officials of Irish and non-Irish persuasion as well, that they need to be engaged on this issue because it matters to them as Americans, because it matters to them as world citizens, that the people of Ireland have uh, their own destiny in their own hands. And the only way to actually have that happen is by Irish unification for the entire Ireland of, Island of Ireland. Okay, thank you, Joe and Jerry. So we have another question. This one is from Catherine Love, and it's in two parts. So, with what practical arguments will you persuade those who, one, are economically and culturally afraid of letting go of the link with Britain, and two, those who might fear the North will be more of a cost than a gain? How will you get them to support unity? I'll go to Jerry first, please. Well, I, I think, first of all, the challenge and the onus and the responsibility is on us who want Irish unity to persuade others who might be agnostic on it or frightened of it or hostile to it, that that's the best future, whatever it means. And it's a shared Ireland. It's an Ireland where everybody has ownership, which is inclusive and pluralistic and so on. So, so it isn't an Ireland just for the Republicans. It's an Ireland for every single person who lives here. And I think uh, America can play a role in that also in terms of the unionists. You know, you can provide platforms for, for, for those unionists who uh, want to see a, a future based upon togetherness as opposed to division for those unionists who are rethinking their, their position. So we, we, we can, can find all places that it's possible to find where we can moderate these issues out and discuss these issues out and educate each other. We also have to listen to the unionists. It, it, it's really important that, you know, th 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 this isn't just a figment of, of, of their imagination. I mean, they're unionists because they have decided that that's the best, uh, the, the best dispensation for them. So what, what, what we need to do is then to say to them, okay, well, tell us why that's so. If you really believe in the, the union, then, you know, ex explain Give us the, the merits of it. Give us the virtues of it. The issue about not being able to afford it, there can be no way that anyone can disagree with the fact that a, a, a single island, a single Ireland approach, a united Ireland approach, 
with responsibility for our economic levers of power as well as for our political levers of power, will run the place better than Boris Johnson. <laughs> will run the place better than Theresa May. Will run the place better than Margaret Thatcher. You know, I I would far rather have Arling Foster as a T-shock running the place with the rest of us than somebody from England who doesn't know the place, has no connectedness uh, with it. So there are big, there are big uh, issues to be argued out here, but the, the e economic value, the economic benefits of Irish unity are obvious to anyone looking at it. Okay, thank you, Jerry. Joe, would you like to add yeah, anything? Yeah, I would just add to that. You heard what I said before about the tremendous social changes that have happened in the Republic of Ireland, which uh, has been really admired by many throughout the world uh, over the last decade. And that's not the Irish government, but the Irish people who have made that happen. Uh, I, these arguments about the absorption of the North or the absorption of the South uh, have, have been going back and forth, depending on, on, the, on the advantage of one over the other. Uh, but I think what Jerry is saying is that putting all that aside, uh, being a United Ireland, it will sort itself. It will sort itself uh, to the betterment of all the people of Ireland, regardless of political persuasion, regardless, regardless of religious persuasion uh, or ethnic persuasion or racial persuasion. Ireland has become a multi, much more multi-ethnic and racial country than it was in the 1970s in my first visit there. So uh, I, I do think that there's, I put hope in the people, um, but that, uh, as Jerry mentioned as well, that the, the historically this, the, these arguments have been used uh, as, as reasons not to move forward, when in fact they're the reason to move forward, uh, to give everyone a voice and opportunity to speak in a republic that is representative of all the people of the island. Okay, thank you, Joe. So I just want you both to know we're moving into our final quarter of the show. So I have another question. One listener points out that the Trump administration has recently appointed Mick Mulvaney as envoy to Northern Ireland. What would you both like to see him bring to this role? Uh, Jerry, would you like to say it first? Well, I, I wish him well. I think he has to deliver. It's a serious uh, job. He has many illustrious uh, predecessors. You know, the first one was uh, George Megal way back. George Mitchell, <laughs> way back in the day, Senator George Mitchell, and uh, you know he's he's a, an outstanding example of what uh, anyone else in that job has to do. So uh, it's it's an important appointment, and we need to see delivery. Okay, thank you, thank you, Jerry. Joe, I know uh, Mick Mulvaney. I served with him in the House. Uh, and again, although we have we come from different different political persuasions, he's a Republican. I'm a Democrat. Uh, I'm from uh, the Northeast in New York. He's from the South. Um, but I would I would say this: I I don't have much faith in this administration in terms of its commitment towards the people of Ireland uh, writ large. Uh, but I do think this needs to be more than a symbolic appointment. I think for Mulvaney himself, he's someone who's very much aware of his Irishness. Uh, actually had taken some risk prior to going into the administration on immigration issues, uh, especially as it pertained to the Irish. Uh, so I think that's a positive. But I think Jerry is right that this cannot just be simple, simply window dressing, that, the, you know, this, this has to be real and substantive and to help move the needle forward. Um, I have concerns, generally speaking, uh, about this administration writ large, but I do think Mick Mulvaney, uh, if, he, if he's able to, engage in the way in which we would like that to happen. I, th I think it'd be, it could be a good force there. Okay, thank you. That's very insightful. Thank you. So we've talked about Mary Lou calling for a unity referendum within five years. And Jerry, can I ask you why now? What makes it winnable and doable now? Well, you know, there's a, there's a fairly long project trajectory, which I won't go into now, of the consistency of the Sinn Féin position and looking for an alternative to conflict and trying to get rid of the Government of Ireland Act. And one of our main successes in the Good Friday Agreement uh, negotiations was to get that Government of Ireland Act done away with and get it replaced by this issue of a referendum. And, you know, that's 20 odd years ago, and there has been progress made on, on, on many fronts. 
But the day for the agreement to deliver on the referendum is now coming. And we just don't want to have a referendum. We want to win the referendum. We want to secure it in the first instance, and we want to win it. So what, what indicates that it possibly could be won? And it will be a big challenge, don't, don't get me wrong. Well, first of all, the uh, demographic and societal changes in the North. Also, a lot of what Joe very graphically described there of changes in the South as well, that we now have a more equal society in terms of some of these big social issues, which when the people were given the chance, the people dealt with properly and in a gracious and uh, generous uh, way. The, the outworkings of, of Brexit were, were people have become used to an all island approach. You know, there, there, are, there are hundreds of cross-border actions which now uh, happen uh, just without even thinking about it, which are now under threat and people don't want, want that to happen. The, the effect of Brexit on uh, our agricultural industry, on our food industry, uh, the, 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 there are so many ag examples where a, a, a joined up approach is, is required. And I, and I suppose the Good Friday Agreement generation who want to go forward and, and what, you know, have that lived in peace, they were born into peace, they, they want a decent, as we all do, a decent uh, life, comfortable working with their neighbours. And then finally, the end, and this is really crucial, the end of the uh, electoral majority, which unionists used to enjoy. That's finished. And of course, the growth of Sinn Féin and progressive politics across the island of Ireland. So there are all the different factors that, you know, some of them aren't planned, some of them are planned by us and others. But, uh, you know, Brexit wasn't planned. <laughs> the, you know, I, I, I even give you the examples of the pandemic. One of the things that's coming out of the pandemic is the need for an all island public health uh, service. And and just just one, one lastly, we point on, on it all. For a British government to withhold this referendum will be an indictment of an Irish government because it is a joint agreement. And the Irish government need to, need to press the British government and plan for the new Ireland, plan for the new uh, agreed Ireland that we can have. And that's, that's the onus upon, it's only a caretaker government at the moment, but that's the onus on any government in Dublin. And it clearly will be a key objective, a cornerstone policy for Sinn Féin and government in Dublin. Okay, thank you, Jerry. Joe, do you have anything to add to that? I just said briefly, as Jerry said, this will not be an easy process. This is a long, drawn-out process. I think one of the beauties of the Good Friday Agreement is that not that it was created by government, but it was ratified by the people of all of Ireland, both in the North and the, and the Republic itself, uh, majorities in both, and that one of the culminations of the agreement itself is stated that the island would have an opportunity at some point to either unite or not. Uh, that's stated in the agreement, that the, 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 and that all governments will recognize um, the will of the Irish people, both in the North and in the South, when that, when that moment happens. And so I think uh, it is the fulfillment of the Good Friday Agreement in its, in its essence uh, to have at some point a border poll. Okay, thank you. So we are moving towards our concluding statements, but we have one final question. It's a light-hearted one, and it's from somebody who identifies himself as Kiran. And Kiran asks, "What song will you each sing the day Ireland is reunited?" Thirty seconds to think about it. Well, uh, well, Joe's the singer in this company. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go to you first, Jerry. <laughs> well, I think I think a nation once again. Uh, Ireland long a province be a nation once again for me maybe just a perfect day uh. I, I think 
nation once again, uh, given uh, Thomas Davis, uh, his young life, what he accomplished in that life in terms of literary work, uh, the West Awake, uh, as well as a nation once again, but the meaning behind it as a young island, islander, as a, as a member of the ascendancy and, and Protestant um, during that time, showing you really working towards unity of, of religion, uh, I think, um, and taking that aspect out of it. Uh, I, an island of Ireland that is for the people of Ireland, regardless of all those isms that we attach ourselves to. Okay, thank you both. So if only we had time and for you to sing way, that. To a beautiful day wouldn't be bad either. <laughs> right. okay. Well said, Joe. That was very well put. Well played, you. <laughs> okay, so we are coming towards the end. So could you each give a concluding statement of maybe two minutes, just saying what you think the next steps are in this very important process? And Jerry, again, may I stay, start with you, please? Well, thank you, Christine, for moderating this so efficiently. And thank you, Joe, for all your work and all the people that you've worked with over all the years and best wishes to both you and to both your families. Uh, essentially, get active. If you're active already, be more active. Irish unity is the goal. Irish unity is a doable project. The means is a referendum on unity contained in the Good Friday Agreement. So get out there. Get it raised wherever you can. Support the friends of Sinn Féin. If you can go on to their emailing list, you'll get information as it goes along. But just remember, you can be the Irish American that comes home to a free, united, peaceful and prosperous Ireland. OK, brilliant. Thank you, Jerry. And Joe? I think this is a great opportunity uh, to reinvigorate, as Jerry and I both said, Irish America. Uh, into the cause of Irish unity and the, the United of the Island of Ireland. Uh, and also an opportunity for Irish America to educate uh, elected officials and uh, our brothers and sisters in this country who may not fully understand what we're talking about. They think, has that already happened? Isn't the violence over? Um, isn't uh, there's no longer a border, uh, et cetera, et cetera, the Good Friday Agreement. It's an opportunity for us to, again, uh, begin that education process as to what the fulfillment of the agreement really is um, for our, from our perspective, and that is ultimately the uniting of the island of Ireland. So we ask Irish America to re-engage your elected officials, if they're Irish or not Irish. Uh, sometimes the Irish themselves can be the most difficult to, to break through on. They know it all. But find those allies in the House of Representatives, in the Senate, and work towards that event and, and towards that moment. It's not just about Ireland. It's not just about our efforts here in the States. It's about our world and giving this tiny nation the opportunity to actually join uh, in fulfillment as a whole island, the nations of the world. Wow. Okay, well, thank you. That was a very enlightening debate, a very lively debate. So I want to say a final thank you to Jerry Adams, to Joe Crowley, to all our listeners, especially those who sent in questions, to our team, Eric, Mick, Marty, and Kiran, and to everybody everywhere, please stay safe and stay well. Thank you. Thanks, Christine. Thank you, Chris. Thank you.